Okay. This is the smallest class we've had so far, I think. I wonder why. <laughs> being sandwiched between two holidays doesn't, work, doesn't help, huh? Okay, it's good to have you guys here, the dedicated ones. Uh, this is going to be my last lecture this semester. Next week we're going to have exercises, so that'll be our first announcement. But hopefully it'll be a fun lecture. Since several of you asked uh, and predicted some of the things that I'm going to tell, uh, I'll post these first. Basically, you have practice exercise one that's on the website, and we're going to post solutions to that. If you would like to turn in what you've done, uh, I would suggest scanning what you've done and sending it to us or giving it to one of the TAs. If you would like to keep a copy, it's always better to scan or give a copy. Uh, and I think I'd like to mention that. Remember that these are to facilitate your learning. They're not indicative of what will necessarily appear on the exam. For example, we're not going to ask you to fill out an 80 entry microcode or 64 entry microcode or even a 20 entry microcode maybe one or two or three so there is one exercise actually that lets you implement some instruction for example those type of questions are possible but the longer type of questions for example the repeat move s is very complicated uh, for an exam but having done that in the practice exercises you will hopefully understand the concepts much better and you will be able to figure out what to do in a simpler question, right? That's the goal of the practice exercises, for you to really learn the material. Uh, so, for example, uh, I mean, there, there are really interesting questions that could come up, right, with a microcode. We may miss a signal, we may have a signal that's wrong and tell you which signal is wrong here. Of course, in a simple microcoded machine. These are actually really fun things. And these are real examples of what people deal with in real life. Uh, okay. Uh, so we'll, po uh, we'll post practice exercises too also. I don't know if my TAs are... They're not here yet, huh? Where are they? <laughs> oh, there. Okay, yeah. <laughs> they're hiding in the back. When are, when are we going to post these? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Soon is the right answer. By next, week. By next week, yes, that's that's a good answer. So you'll have the solutions. You'll have the second set of practice exercise, which covers everything else we did not cover so far. And separately from this, so again, the goal of the practice exercise will be uh, to facilitate your learning. Uh, and separately from this, we'll have example exam questions. So these will be more like what could potentially appear in the exam. So I want to keep these separate. These may be very, very time-consuming. These will, of course, depends on how long, uh, how many questions we have on the exam, but these will probably be less time-consuming uh, than the other ones. So I keep monitoring the course website for these. So earlier part of next week, hopefully, we'll get some of these out. When is the exam, by the way? There's a date, right? I don't remember the date now. August? Okay. Okay, so next week is our, uh, going to be our last week. Uh, there will be a review session. Uh, which date will depend on uh, what we cover today uh, and what we want to cover uh, next week. Any questions related to these? Nothing? Everything is good? Well, clearly, everybody who's here is very dedicated to the course, so everything may be good here, but maybe for the other ones who are not here... <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, so announcements. Uh, since this is going to be my last lecture here uh, for this semester, uh, I'll make this. I'll say, I said this before, but not officially, I guess. So if you're interested in learning more about the material, if this is, sounds exciting to you, or doing research in computer architecture, I have three suggestions. One is email me with your interest. If you're interested, I have a lot of ideas and uh, topics for projects. Of course, doing well in this course helps. Uh, and take the computer architecture course in the fall. If not this fall, next fall, uh, I'll be offering it every... This is fall, right? Yeah, yeah, fall. <laughs> Starting September. That's better. Uh, and do readings and assignments on your own. So th there are a lot of things that I mentioned during this course. So you can always read on your own. That helps learning more. 
But if you want to do it in a more directed fashion, I'd be happy to help out with that if you email me and uh, express your interest in learning or doing research. And uh, related to the second part, doing research part, there are many exciting projects and research positions available uh, in my group, spanning a lot of things. Memory systems, which we didn't talk about too much in this, lecture, in this course. Uh, GPUs, FPGAs, which you've been working with, heterogeneous systems. New execution paradigms, like in memory computing, if you attended my inaugural lecture, I talked about this. Uh, and a lot of different interactions in architecture, security, reliability, energy, performance, dot, dot, dot. And these other specialized architectures for medical, health, or genomics. So computer architecture is really a growing, booming field at the moment, uh, as you can see from all of the different kind of products that are out there. And that's going to increase, that's not going to change especially with uh, the underlying technology challenges that I mentioned earlier and the Moore's Law uh, slowing down. Moore's Law is the number of transistors are essentially increasing at an exponential rate, right? Uh, according to Intel, it's every 18 months that the number of transistors doubles. But it's an empirical thing, so it depends on how fast that increases. Especially that slowing down, computer architecture is becoming much, much more interesting today. How do you take advantage of the software and the hardware and uh, design it in a much more efficient way is becoming much more important. That's why there are a lot of interesting topics to examine. And there's a bunch of dot, dot, dot over here. So if you have interest, let me know. Okay, so uh, last week we covered some of the memory systems, caches, but I'm going to go back, to, uh, go back and complete the slide, basically. Everything over here was green, except we didn't finish this one fully. So I'm going to finish this one. <laughs> And I'm going to talk about two things out of order. So we'll start with systolic arrays. Any questions? OK, good. Let's, uh, let's talk about systolic arrays. Uh, this is really interesting because uh, people talk about biologically inspired architectures, if you uh, think about it. And neural networks is an example of biologically inspired architecture, right? It's really uh, designed based on what humans thought at any point in time how neurons behave, how the brain behaves. Now, it's not clear if we fully understand how that behaves, but that's a model, that we have a model of how neurons behave, and based on that, we've developed neuro neural networks. The simplest neural network is a perceptron, which we're not going to go into here, but right now, it's taking off a lot, both at the hardware side and the software side. But people normally don't think of systolic arrays uh, as uh, motivated by uh, biology, but this is actually... If you read the original paper, it's perfectly motivated by biology, and this will become very clear, hopefully soon. So the goal uh, in, the, in the 1980s, when these were first designed, was to design accelerator. Not a, not a complete execution model, but an accelerator that helps with some tasks. Uh, that is simple, regular. Uh, they wanted to keep the unique parts small and regular. High concurrency, very high performance. You want to accelerate some important task. At that time, it was actually vision and image processing, which was hard. Today, people are looking at the neural networks, for example. Uh, and they wanted to balance computation and I.O. bandwidth. This will become a little bit more clear in the next slide when I talk about the picture. So the idea is very simple, basically. Instead of having a single processing element and going to memory every time for each data element uh, to get the data and to process the data with that element, have an array of processing elements Bring the data in, and data flows through that array of processing elements, and then eventually you output that back into the memory. Of course, to uh, make this work, you need to carefully orchestrate the flow of data between the processing elements and put the processing elements nicely such that the data flows, uh, you, you input the data into the array, and then the data flows between the elements. Of course, each element does something to the data, and then the data gets output back into memory. Uh, basically, this, the, these processing elements, this array of processing elements, can now collectively transform a piece of input data before outputting it to memory. And the benefit is, you can now maximize the computation done on a single piece of data element brought to memory, brought from memory. So if you think about the uh, processor, the single processor we designed, for e each instruction gets a single piece of data element, brings it to the processing element, uh, and then you execute it and store the result into memory. As opposed to that, we're going to do something like this. So you can think of this as a von Neumann machine, if you will, right? A very simplified version. You have the input, you process the, uh, the data, 
and then you put the result back into memory, and you keep doing that. Instead, the systolic array looks like this, basically. You get one piece of input data, feed it into a processing element, it, uh, it does something on it, outputs it, and the output goes directly into the next processing element, and then it does something to it, and then the output goes directly into the next processing element, dot, 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 until you don't know what else to do with the data and but, but to store it. And if you look at the calculation here, uh, you basically do one operation every 100 nanoseconds, if you will, and with some calculation, if you look at this paper, you can do 5 million operations per second. This is 1982, remember. Uh, but with this, you have six processing elements, so you can actually increase your throughput to six times 5 million operations per second. It's 30 million operations per second without changing the memory at all. Right? You just do more things on the same piece of data. And this is a beautiful paper, which is not required reading, but if you want to understand more, you should take a look at that. Uh, it's beautifully written. So uh, why is it biological? <laughs> it's called systolic because memory is really the heart pumping blood, and processing elements are really the cells, basically processing stuff based on that blood. Right. It's not bad, actually. This is how exactly the human body operates. You don't, you don't, uh, so you don't go to the heart with every part of your, uh, every other organ, and it requests for blood, right? You pump the blood, and it flows through all of your body to all of the organs, maybe in different directions, uh, but uh, you don't do this, basically. This is very, very inefficient. It's much more efficient that your data or blood flows through your body and then goes back to be cleaned up or something else, right? So that's the idea. Okay. Uh, I think I've said this before, but it's basically you have data flow from the computer memory in a rhythmic fashion, passing through many processing elements before it returns to memory. And I've already said this basically, similar to blood flow. Uh, many veins operate simultaneously, and it can be many dimensional as well. Uh, we will see some, we may see some examples of this. So why, basically, special purpose accelerators and architectures usually need what I told you earlier, simple, regular design, high concurrency, and balanced computation and I.O. bandwidth. So if you look at this, this may not be balanced. You may have a processing element that can do a lot of things if you actually replicate it, but you're not using uh, the, the piece of data really well. Uh, memory is really the bottleneck, as you've seen in the last week. If you bring the data, you're spending a lot of time and a lot of, uh, you're limited by the bandwidth, so why waste it uh, with a single operation? Okay. Okay, we've said this before. So what are the differences from pipelining? This looks like pipelining, right? And at a, at a level, it's really pipelining. But it's not really pipelining a single instructions flow. It's really pipelining the processing of the data across many processing elements. So it's not the pipelining that we've seen before. The difference is these are individual processing elements. They're not the individual stages that an instruction needs to go through. These are individual things that need to be done on the data. But at some level, it's pipelining. You're really pipelining the uh, things that you do on the same piece of data, as opposed to pipelining the instruction flow. And this, uh, the, the other difference here is the array structure can be nonlinear and multidimensional. Uh, so it could be a two-dimensional matrix, for example. You may be inputting data from the top and the bottom, and the data may be flowing diagonally, as we will see in Google's TPU very briefly. That's exactly what they did. Instead of having a single-dimensional array over here, they had a two-dimensional matrix. And uh, processing element connections uh, can be multi-directional. So for example, if you have a two-dimensional array, you can actually communicate between all of your neighbors, potentially. And data can flow uh, in different directions. And it could be different speed also. And you can actually generalize it more. These processing elements can actually have local memory. So now it's becoming more like a beefy processing element that, that can do more than a simple task. And they can execute kernels, actually. They can, they can ex execute small pieces of code rather than a, sim a, sim a small piece of the operation that we're doing. And the operation could be actually a matrix multiplier, for example. So let me give you an example of this. Uh, and I'll take the example of convolution. How many of you guys know convolution? Oh, not many. OK. You don't learn this during high school? No, not convolution. And you don't take EE classes, so that's okay. So 
I'm not going to go into the theory of convolution. That's not the purpose over here. But we're, take, we're going to take that as an example. So convolution is basically you take multiple functions and you convolve them. Uh, you basically take the integral uh, of a function uh, over the other one, uh, and then the integral of the product of the function, where the fu one function is really shifted by something. But we're not going to go into the theory. I'm going to define it this way. Uh, because uh, So basically, you, you have a sequence of weights, w i w1 to wk, and you have an input sequence, x1 to xn, and you compute the result sequence, y1 to that yn plus 1 minus k, where yi is equal to this polynomial over here. Basically, weight 1 xi plus weight 2 xi plus 1 plus dot 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 plus this thing over here. So each element, each y element, is of this form. It's a polynomial of uh, the products of different elements, as you can see. And this comes from the integral computation. You don't need to know exactly why it comes from, but you need to know that this is an important thing uh, important computation that's used in many, many image processing tasks especially. So if you want to do a filtering of two functions, if you want to take an image and filter it based on some filter, let's say you want to, uh, you want to zoom into parts of an image, you can actually express it as a convolution. Or if you want to do multiple things in multiple images, you can express things on, uh, as convolutions. For example, pattern matching. If you want to search for a pattern in an image, you can express that as a convolution or correlation. Dot, dot, dot. Okay, so this is actually a very good fit for acceleration. You can actually design a specialized circuit that does this. Of course, you could design a really specialized circuit that's not even programmable. That's not our goal here. But we want to be able to design a circuit that's good at doing convolution and maybe similar tasks, right? Uh, and this is a systolic array that can actually do this. Uh, I'll give you a very simple example over here. So basically, it's built using this processing element. We're going to define the processing element like this. Basically, it stores a weight, which is this sequence of weights over here. And every processing element stores a different weight. But this is a generic element. It has the weight. It takes as input the x vector, which is basically the input sequence over here. Weights don't change in this case. Let's assume that. That's why you store the weight, so it's not an input over here. Uh, and what it does is basically it produces x out as x in. Basically, whatever x comes, it goes out also. And takes y from here, which is the input y. right? And then it produces y out. So what is y out? y out is equal to y in times weight dot x in. So basically, it takes x in, multiplies by the weight. And the result uh, adds it to the y in. And y out basically becomes that. And you can actually express convolution that way, basically. This, that's basically uh, convolution, but the data flows uh, later on to actually get to this equation. So if you think about this, uh, let's, let's actually expand this equation over here. Uh, if you look at three elements over here, y1 is equal to w1x1, w2x2, plus w3x3, the addition of all of those. y2 is equal to w1x2, w2x3, uh, w3x4, and their addition. And y3 is equal to this thing, basically. So that's uh, the nature of convolution. So a systolic array would look like this, basically. If you have this processing element, your systolic array would look like this. And you would be feeding uh, x's from the left over here. And y's would be getting out on the left uh, 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 from here. So let's, let's take a look at uh, how, how we would get the first one. So in the first cycle, we feed x1. So x1 eventually gets here. Once, once x1 gets here, you need to feed y1 such that they collide at the same time. So you need to orchestrate the data flow. That's what I meant by orchestrating the data flow. So this is an array over here. Let's, let's assume this is just three elements over here. In the first cycle, x1 goes here. Second cycle here. Third cycle, x1 gets here. Which means that in the third cycle, you need to feed in an output thing such that you can get it out. OK, x1 is here. In the third cycle, you basically compute w1, x1 plus y1. So now y1, the data over here, is w1, x1 plus y1. Right? Make sense? <laughs> so now you've got that one over there, which means that that now needs to be multiplied 
by x2, right? So you have w1, x1. Uh, well, y1 is initially 0. Let me put that over there, because y1, initially, there's no input. So you have w1, x1 here, which means that when w1, x1 is here, you should really have x2 right here, which means that you should have fed x2 one cycle after x1. Right? So in the first cycle, uh, when, 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 in the cycle when x1 is here, you're computing this, but there shouldn't be x2 over here, because you're going to produce the value over here next time, uh, du uh, du during the next cycle. So x2 should arrive when the result of this element over here is ready. That's why you see a, dif a distance. Uh, x1 is fed, uh, the, the input elements, input vectors fed uh, every other cycle into this array. Make sense? So when the output of this first cell or processing element is ready, you have x2 here. So what you have is, uh, this, this cell will compute x2 times w2 plus whatever the result was over here, which was w1, x1, right? Make sense? And then it will produce that result. The result will come here. And during this cycle, there will not be any input over here, but when the result is ready, you will have x3 inside here. And then you, this will compute x3, w3 plus whatever you had over here, which was produced by this element and this element, the addition of those, w2, x2, w1, x1, and then this will add the w3, x3, and you will get y1 in the first cycle over here. In the next cycle, you won't get anything, but in the next cycle, you will get w2, and if you actually go through all of the calculations, you will see that, uh, sorry, well, you will get y2, and y in, in, if you go through all of the calculations, you will see that y2 is equal to this one. Make sense? Because uh, when x2 comes here, you'll have uh, w1 over here, and you'll multiply w1 with x2, and that will be the result. And then when then x3 comes here, you'll have x3 times w2 plus w1 uh, x2, which is exactly what this is. And then uh, when x4 comes here, you'll have that over here. Make sense? So if you don't fully get it, you'll need to go through the details. I explained it fast because I know how it works. But it's pretty cool, actually. If your computation is like this, you can feed in your data every other cycle, and you get, you get an output every other cycle on the left. Okay, this is pretty cool. And this is exactly uh, the type of computation that exists, very similar type of computation that exists in a convolutional neural network, for example, or a deep learning engine. And that's how, well, maybe not this simple, but it's really a matrix multiplication. And that's what uh, Google took advantage of, if you will. So how do you implement this? I'm not going to go through this in detail, and if you actually look at the paper, you can understand more. But this is basically implemented using an adder and a multiplier, right? Uh, and this is the adder. That's the multiple. X, sorry, X is the multiplier, and this is the adder. So you can see that there are some ignored outputs. So you need to orchestrate your data output also. Some outputs that you're getting out of this circuit is useless because you're not really feeding data during those cycles, right? Only when you have the data that's fed uh, is uh, over there, you get a good output from the circuit. Sometimes you need to fill in null inputs or you just ignore the inputs, right? And ignore the outputs. Okay, so basically here, uh, there, you can go into the implementation, but I'm not going to go into this in detail. You can overlap the uh, execution of addition and multiplication uh, if you implement add and the multiplier separately. Okay, any questions? You should really read this paper. It's a pretty cool paper. Okay, so the, the, uh, it's clear that one needs to carefully orchestrate when data elements are input to the array and when the output is actually buffered. Uh, so this gets even more involved uh, when the array dimensionality increases. So if you have a two-dimensional array, that becomes more difficult. And even more difficult when the processing elements are less predictable in terms of latency. That's why this is not a very general programming, uh, the, the very general uh, hardware execution model at this point. It's very useful for specific tasks where you can actually fit the computation very nicely to this form. Uh, for example, if the processing elements are not very predictable in terms of latency, 
Now you need to figure out how to stall all of the computation that's happening, right? Very similar to what we've done in the pipelining. Or you need to know how to schedule the operands coming into the uh, array or, uh, uh, or the vector uh, based on all of those latencies. So it becomes complicated, basically. Here, in this example that I showed you, it's taking one cycle, right? This operation is not... It's very predictable. You know exactly what's happening, and you can design it to be one cycle or n cycles. And then you know exactly when to feed in the data. But if each of these elements are different, and they actually, uh, for example, if this needs to wait for 500 cycles sometimes, and 200 cycles some other times, and one cycle some other time, then you have a problem, right? You cannot orchestrate the flow of the data very well, which means that you need to somehow stall the movement of the data. Now, that becomes more general purpose, of course. The problem is it's not as beautiful anymore. And it's not as efficient. OK. Uh, OK, let's look at the advantages and disadvantages. Like everything else, uh, this has advances and downsides. Advantage is very specialized, right? Computation now uh, needs to fit the processing element organization and functions. So once you make that, uh, or, or your hardware really fits well with the computation. Now, this is good for energy efficiency. It's simpler design and high concurrency and performance. So you can imagine a million element uh, convolution happening, and you have a million processing elements, and you keep them busy all the time, right? If you're doing many, many convolutions, if you're processing many, many images, for example, and that's the only thing that you're doing. And... Uh, it's always good to do more with less memory bandwidth requirements, right? Your memory bandwidth is limited, so why don't you fetch once and do many, many things to it? So downside is exactly the <laughs> advantage. Usually advantage specialized buys you a lot of efficiency, but it also makes you less applicable, right? Now your computation really needs to fit the, function un uh, the, the functional unit organization and the organization of the array. But uh, people have actually tried to make this uh, a little bit more general. And I'm going to take a stretch a little bit, talk about how people have tried to make it more general. Basically, people try to put more weights. Instead of having a single weight, just like we saw in the convolution, maybe you have a small memory over there, and you fetch the weights. And when the data comes in, it specifies, oh, I want this type of weight. So it's more general now, right? Uh, you can select them on the fly, so you can basically ad, uh, implement much more, uh, I, I don't want to say intelligent, but much more sophisticated forms of filtering. For example, depending on, I don't know, let's say you have an image processor, and you want to blend the color with some color, which is some weight, or some other color, which is some other weight. Now you have a choice, right? You can choose between blue or red. And these are different weights that you're going to apply to the pixels. So that's one very uh, simple example. But you can imagine it uh, in some other ways. If you have a neural network, again, that's based on weights. You have, you basically figured out some neural network and you have these different weights that you need to apply to different inputs. And those weights might be different depending on the condition, right? Whether you're doing, I don't know, recognizing cats versus recognizing a language. The weights that you need may be very different. Okay, so that makes it uh, more, uh, Programmable, certainly. And if you take this further, if you stretch your mind in even more, now each processing element can have its own data and instruction memory. Now it could be almost like a processor. And data memory can store partial and temporary results and constants. Uh, and this leads to now stream processing or pipeline parallelism, which I will briefly talk about. So of course, now be this is becoming more general purpose. If you take it to the extreme, these are all cores, right? These are different processing cores. They're connected with this sort of network, and you input the data into it. And if you implement stalling in those cores, then it's like it's nothing different from a multiprocessor network. But you could keep things still simple. Maybe, maybe you don't do the stalling part, and you, uh, all of your uh, uh, ex uh, execution is predictable. That way, you keep putting in the data, and you keep getting outputs while keeping things simple. So more generally, stage execution. Let me give you an example. This is, we're going to talk about a programming model, which I, uh, which I believe has actually uh, a lot uh, uh, that it owes to, uh, to systolic arrays, because systolic arrays were a concept that was developed earlier, 
And people later develop concepts uh, like stream processing and programming models. I'll give you one example. Uh, it's a pipeline parallel programming model. Have, has anyone heard of this before? Has anyone programmed in something like this? Probably not. That's good. Because not, not many people do. But this is one way of actually parallelizing programs. Uh, so let's take a loop. Uh, now we've seen in the past vectorizing loops, right? If loop iterations are independent, you can execute them in parallel. What if loop iterations are not really independent? There are some dependencies. But you can actually find uh, some portions in the code. Let's take a look at this, basically. Uh, you need to basically uh, execute. Um, so you, we have this loop over here. We are going to divide into stages, A, B, C. And this is in a single processor, processor 0 or element 0, you can execute this in a sequ sequential fashion, right? A, B, A0, B0, C0, this from the first iteration, second iteration, third iteration, dot, dot, dot. And it takes some time. So maybe some programmer actually splits this loop iteration into three pieces. This is a pipeline parallel or pipeline program. And what you can do is execute all of the A's from different iterations in processor 0, all of the Bs from different iterations in processor 1, all of the Cs from different iterations in processor 2. And uh, A0, B0, C0 is executed sequentially. So when the A0 produces some output, it goes here. When B0 produces some output, it goes here. Dot, dot, dot. When A1 produces some output, it goes here. When B1 produces output, it goes here. So this is how you can parallelize a loop. And if you look at this, the different portions, stages in the loop, uh, in different iterations, uh, the, the different stages are executed in parallel, right? But the same stage is executed sequentially. Right? In the processor zero, you know that A0 is executed before A1, before A2, before A3, before A4. Which means that if there's a dependence between the A, it's still executed sequentially, but you've parallelized some other part of the loop. Now you can execute A4 with B3 and C2, right? You can execute, you can parallelize basically later parts. Same as B over here, right? B, uh, B, B, Z, B1 may be depend on B0, B2 may be depend on B1. You're executing them sequentially, but you you're actually exploiting parallelism across these three processors. So that's the idea. Basically, you're staging the execution, or you're pipelining the execution of the loop. How do you pipeline it? Basically, this way. It's A0 produce an output that goes to B0, that goes to C0. You can think of this as a systolic array at some level, right? But this is a very cool way of actually parallelizing uh, loops that are not vectorizable. I mean, remember, our definition of a loop was a vectorizable loop. All iterations are independent. Right? Here, they don't need to be. Only these little stages or little portions, uh, well, these, these, these portions need to be independ uh, independent, but th there could be dependence across these little portions. So across the AIs, across the BIs, and across the CIs. Does that make sense? OK, cool. So I'll give you, uh, OK, uh, basically I'll uh, make it a little bit more formal. Loop iterations, you divide them into code segments called stages. This is another treatment of it. You basically figure out the dependencies and divide them into three things, in this case, A, B, C. And basically assign all of the A's from different, uh, from different iterations to the same core to be executed in order. This is a visualization. It, it doesn't need to be a hardware queue, although people have actually designed hardware queues as well with this. But it could be a software queue. And all of the B's go here, and all of the C's go here, and then they communicate through these queues. When A, A actually produces some results, it goes, gets communicated to the B from the same iteration. When B produces some results, it, it basically reads the input from here uh, and then produces a result. That result gets communicated to C from the same iteration. Make sense? If not, I'll give you one example of file compression. So people actually, uh, if, you have a lot, if you actually have a lot of files to compress or if you divide your files uh, such that you have a lot of things to compress, this is one example, basically. And this is not the perfect example necessarily, but for example, you can program this such that you have an input file and you have the output data. 
Uh, and remember, we're not fetching anything. We're not going to go back to the input file and fetch again. We're going to take the input file, send it into the stage, process it, and that sends the result into the next stage. That processes it, that sends the result into the next stage, process it, that sends the result into the next stage, that process it, that sends the result into the next stage, and then process it, and eventually output back somewhere. And this is one example. We, I mean, file compression actually involves a lot of things, and you can actually pipeline different files or different pieces of the file uh, this way. Of course, with this kind of, uh, with this kind of uh, execution, it's always a problem. This is just like a pipeline, right? That's why it's called pipeline parallel, except this is really a programming model, not, uh, not how you actually design the hardware necessarily here. Uh, but you, you, see, you have all the issues that we have in pipelining at the software level. So if you look at this, if this compress takes the longest amount of time, your throughput is really dictated by how long this compress takes. Right? So how do you make this higher throughput? You divide this compression into two stages at the software level. So all of the concepts that you're seeing right now are actually at some level very, very applicable to the software as well because software programs can be written this way. And you will see more and more and more of this uh, if you uh, study uh, architecture more and more. Okay, any questions on this? I mean, you don't need to exactly understand, but you can guess what these are doing, uh, probably. And it's not the only way of doing file compression, clearly. So let me go back to systolic arrays. So systolic arrays have led to this kind of uh, systolic computation uh, in general. Not necessarily the hardware accelerator design, which we talked about, but you have the systolic computation. This is essentially a systolic computation. The files are the things that are flowing in, and the results are the things that are getting out uh, over here. And they go through an array of processing elements, if you think about it, or, or an array of code segments. So basically, uh, if we step back, um, the advantage is you make multiple uses of each data item, so this reduces the need for fetching and refetching. And you get high concurrency and a regular design, both data and control flow. Disadvantage is always this, basically. You need to have this regularity in the input and regularity in the operations that you do. If you don't have that, if you're irregular, too bad. Your systolic array becomes very inefficient at that point. Very, very similar to what we've seen in the GPUs, right? In the GPUs, we've seen that if you actually have a branch and one piece of the code this goes this way and another piece of the code goes that way, you waste a lot of your, uh, your processing power. Right? Here, again, similar thing happens, but in a very... Uh, in, in, a, in a somewhat more complicated fashion, perhaps. So as a result, this is relatively special purpose, so you need software programmer support to be a general purpose model, more general purpose model. Let me give you a couple of examples of this. Uh, so when I was teaching uh, this in the past, this was my only example, but now I have Google's TPU, so I'm going to talk about that too. <laughs> so this was actually a concept developed by H.T. Kung at CMU, uh, earlier than this, but uh, they actually designed the warp computer based on this concept. What they had was a linear array of 10 cells, and each cell was a 10 megaflop programmable processor. It was a linear array. And they attached this to a general purpose host machine, and they actually wrote a high-level language and optimizing compiler to program it as well. And they used it very extensively to accelerate vision and robotics tasks, image processing, basically. And if you're really curious, you should read those papers. Some of these are hard to read, so... <laughs> Maybe don't read those papers necessarily. But if you're really curious, feel free. <laughs> you can always get something out of even a hard-to-read paper. But, uh, okay, uh, this, this is basically uh, from their paper. That's exactly what it looks like. They interface it to the host processor, and they basically pump out the data, and the data flows through these cells and then goes back to the heart. And then they keep doing this for many, many images. And if you're really curious, you can look at how the design of this cell is. So it's pretty simple. So remember, this is the 1980s where things were big. Right? So this actually is your processing processor itself, <laughs> by the way. It's not, this, this is a small thing uh, in, your, in, in current processors, but this is really a processor by itself. Okay, so in a modern systolic array, uh, another paper that I would recommend, uh, it's also not so very easily understood, but <laughs> go ahead and take a look at it. Uh, this is from Google this year, uh, and they basically uh, designed this chip, the, the core of which is really the systolic array. And they call it the systolic data flow of the matrix multiply unit. 
And if you look at this, they basically feed in, there's some control to orchestrate the data, just like we've seen in the convolution, but it's two-dimensional in this case. And they basically feed in different, uh, I have a better picture of this somewhere. Yeah, maybe this one, yeah. Okay, let's read this. <laughs> Figure four shows that data flows in from the left and the weights are loaded from the top. I hope this is figure four. Okay, yeah, that's better. There you go. Even though it's not figure four, don't worry. <laughs> so basically data flows in from the left and the weights are loaded from the right. Basically they're doing a matrix multiply of two matrices, a weight matrix and some data matrix. And that's really core of the neural computation uh, that they're accelerating. Basically, all of your uh, uh, queries that you do, I guess, uh, the, 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 whatever Google does. Anyway, I don't know exactly what they do. <laughs> goes through, some of it goes through here. So a given 256 element multiply and accumulate operation moves through the matrix. So it's 256 elements, as you can see, uh, as a diagonal wave front. Uh, the weights are preloaded and take effect with the advancing wave alongside the first data of a new block. That's very similar to what you've seen in the convolution, right? Uh, control our data, our pipeline, to give the illusion that 256 inputs are read at once and that they instantly update one location of each, to, each of 256 accumulators. So this is the view they provide to the software. From a correctness perspective, software is unaware of the systolic nature of the matrix unit, but for performance, it does worry about the latency of the unit. So basically, this is under the hood. The programming is very similar to a GPU, I believe, but... Internally, they convert it into a systolic computation, and they have a systolic array that processes uh, that array computation, that makes a multiplication computation. And you can get 64,000 of them per cycle, as you can see. Okay, so that's cool, right? You can read the paper. Uh, but it's, in the end, the principle is just, it's just another systolic array. How do you make it work? In a real big system, it's interesting for sure, right? How, so there's a lot of other stuff uh, that's over here to control this historic array. In fact, the more difficult part, as this historic array becomes, uh, uh, becomes more general purpose, in this case, it's not very general purpose, as you can see, uh, but still, as this becomes more general purpose and more complicated, you need more control to ensure that the data elements arrive at the right time, weights, in this case, are fetched, they arrive at the same time, and the results are buffered, and the correct results are buffered correct times. Okay, any questions? Cool. Now you know all about computer architecture. <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> we'll cover one more thing. Now this is, this is another thing that's not uh, very commonly thought, uh, taught in classes, but as you can see, systolic arrays were not very commonly taught. I was teaching them, but now they exist in actually perhaps the mass scale that we don't know exactly what the scale of it is. But I'll talk about the coupled access and execute, which actually exists uh, in some of the processors today. The motivation for this is, uh, I left this to the end, uh, because the motivation for this is a little bit different from what we've seen before. The motivation was to actually design something that's general purpose. But at the time this was designed, uh, the, the goal was to uh, make things simple. But not as simple as an in-order processor. You want something between an in-order processor and out-of-order processor, but you don't want to pay the complexity of Thomas Law's algorithm, which people thought to be very complex in the 1980s. Today, everything has Thomas Law's algorithm in a much more simple fashion, of course, so we know that it's not as complex. But the idea actually has some orthogonal components to Thomas Law's algorithm. That's why I want to talk about it. So the idea is very, very simple. You basically decouple the execution of memory accesses versus computations by using two separate instruction streams uh, via ISA visible queues. So basically, this is the ugly picture, which is okay. Uh, at that time, basically, you have an access processor and an execute processor, and they communicate with queues. The job of uh, the access processor is to access memory, get the data, and feed it to the execute operations, like multiplies. Uh, these are loads and stores. These are multiplies, adds, all of the execution uh, things. Now you can ask what happens to the branches. Mm. <laughs> so if you have a branch, you need to synchronize. Basically, that everybody needs to ensure that uh, they're, uh, they're operating, uh, they're, they're executing the correct code. But assume that there are no branches for now. You can actually have a program decoupled into two 
Part of it is all accesses. Part of it is all data. And the accesses can proceed uh, separately from... Uh, sorry, part of it is all accesses. Part of it is all operations on the data that's coming from the accesses. And this execution can proceed if this access unit is stalled for some reason, because it may be waiting for memory. But you may have a lot of operations over here. This way, you don't stall for memory accesses. Memory accesses only stall this processor. And maybe this processor, if these queues are full. Uh, but, but if you have big enough queues over here, this execute processor can keep going ahead, basically. Can keep executing. And that's the idea. You don't have fully out of order execution, but you have this interesting decoupling. You just decoupled your accesses from execute. And this is the paper. You don't, you're not required to read it. Uh, it's actually a beautiful paper. But uh, let me finish this, and then we can, we'll take a break. Uh, basically, the compiler generates two instruction streams in, in the original proposal. Uh, some of those are access, uh, basically an access stream and an execute stream. And you see that uh, if the access stream puts the results into the access execute queue. Right? The results go to, uh, to these queues. You have an access execute to queue. When you read from memory, you put the data over there. And execute processor gets data from the access execute queue and does something. So clearly, if these queues are large, you can actually tolerate a lot of latency. And you don't need to know exactly how this is programmed. This is just to give you the basic concept. The concept is this decoupling, really. So what's the advantage? Basically, execute stream can run ahead of the access stream. You're not basically stalling the execute stream and vice versa, unless your queues are full, of course. So, for example, if, if the access, uh, I'll call this access uh, stream or access unit A. If a, a takes a cache miss, execute can perform useful work. Or if A hits in the cache, it supplies data to lagging execute. So it could go both ways. For some reason, execute may be slower because you may have a lot of long latency operations. But your data may be coming faster because you, can, you, may, be keep, you may be hitting in the cache. Now your uh, execute stream can go ahead of the data uh, access stream. And queues reduce the number of required registers, actually. Um, so you have these queues that are in between, that are not part of the registers, uh, but this really weird area over here uh, where you actually need to uh, communicate the results. So that's what this makes. Uh, this becomes more scalable because you have really queues. So basically, you have limited out of order execution without the complexity that we've seen in Thomas Law's algorithm, right? You don't do wake up and select. You communicate through these queues, really. And it's very limited. Uh, between the access and execute streams. The disadvantage, now somebody needs to be able to partition your program and manage the queues, because this determines the amount of decoupling that you get. And as I uh, said earlier, what happens if you have a branch instruction? Right? If you have a branch instruction that's mispredicted, well, you need to flush both of the queues. So access queue may have actually gone ahead a lot, but you need to uh, flush them. And it, it requires synchronization also, right? because branches affect... Uh, they're not accesses, they're not executes, but they really affect the control flow. Uh, and uh, you can actually have, you need to have multiple instruction streams, you need to partition your program. Of course, people wanted to get rid of this, as you may very well guess, because always partitioning your program is hard. So this can be done with a single one, and this was one of the earlier processors, Astronautics Company, which still happens to be around, I don't know what they do, but they designed this processor, uh, which basically had an access and execute unit. Uh, so these are the execute registers, execute portion of the pipeline. This is the access portion of the pipeline. And you don't need to know this exactly, but exact, uh, this, uh, what they did was they didn't have two instruction streams. They didn't partition the program into two, in this case, uh, like in this case. They basically had a single instruction stream, but steered the instructions. So if they see a load or store instruction, it goes to uh, over here. If they see uh, another instruction, uh, operate instruction, it goes to the execute queue, uh, ex execute unit. Now, of course, they need to patch up the instruction somehow. There, there are some queues over here, uh, which are somewhere over here, basically access registers and execute registers over here. Those are the queues, essentially. And you have some other queues over here. OK, but the basic concept is you really need to uh, decouple access and execute. So. This is another type of processor that actually led to a lot of development in compilers because you actually don't want branches here, right? So branches are bad <laughs> because branches actually uh, eliminate your decoupling. Branches are bad in other processors also, 
But here also, so I, I've given you this idea before, but I'll briefly talk about it uh, to foreshadow what may come in some future architecture courses. But uh, there were a lot of heavy compiler techniques employed such that you eliminate branches in this process. And one idea is loop unrolling, which we briefly talked about. So if you have this loop over here, you don't need to know exactly what it is, but if you really want to understand this code, uh, Okay, yeah. Basically, you have 100 iterations over here, right? Uh, here, we basically put two iterations into one iteration, right? That's the idea. Instead of doing one iteration at a time, you unroll the loop, you basically add one more iteration, and make things work. Make things work means you need to change the index variables a little bit uh, to ensure that both of those iterations are accommodated, right? So it's, you basically unroll the loop such that you do two iterations at a time. Replicate the loop body. So what is the benefit? You get rid of branches, right? That branch is gone now, the loop branch. Well, you actually uh, halve the number of branches that you execute dynamically. Not all of the branches are gone, of course, because you need, but you need to do it less frequently now. You have more computation per branch. And you could keep doing that even more. Uh, Okay, basically you reduce loop maintenance overhead, the induction variable increment or loop condition test. So in addition to the branches, all the computation that goes to the branches uh, are reduced. So it also enlarges your basic block. Now this over here, this entire code is hopefully a single basic block. Assume that there are no branches over there internally. So you can actually enable code optimization and scheduling. And this is actually good for that access execute processor, right? You could actually reorder the code such that accesses go here and executes go here. Right? Of course, there are issues with this. One example issue is, what if the iteration count is not a multiple of the unroll factor? So what is an unroll factor? In this case, the unrolling factor is two. We basically, uh, iteration count is, let's say, 100. Uh, this, is, this may be nice, but what if your uh, unroll factor is not, uh, uh, let's, say, let's say you have, for example, five iterations, but you're unrolling twice. Basically, you need to make it work in that case, right? You cannot do six iterations because that's not what the loop is supposed to do. You cannot do four iterations. You need to do exactly five. So the compiler needs to add some more code. This doesn't look as beautiful anymore to ensure that you actually do the trailing iterations that are beyond the unroll factor. It's very similar to what we've seen in vector codes, right? With the vector strip mining. Remember, if we had 512, uh, iterations and we had, uh, no, 512 doesn't work. We have like, I, I don't know, uh, 527 iterations and 64 uh, things that you can do per iteration, per vector register. You need to, un you need to uh, have a loop that's eight times. Actually, you can unroll all of that. But the remaining part that is not part of your unroll factor, that those uh, 15 iterations need to be done separately. So there needs to be some more code, which adds complexity into the comp compiler to detect that and also other things. And also, this increases code size, right? This is much more compact than this one. You've almost doubled your code size here. Not exactly, but almost doubled. Does that make sense? Yes? Oh, why is it bad? That's an excellent question. It's not always bad. It's always a trade-off, right? So the upside, uh, the downside of having a, a larger code size, it may not fit into your ca uh, caches. As a result, you may get cache misses now. But it's always a trade-off. You can you gain benefit from this also. So, <laughs> yeah. But in general, if you have smaller code, the, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's better to strive for. Okay, so this is actually employed in uh, Pentium 4, uh, in a, not, not loop unrolling. Loop unrolling is employed in all compilers, but decoupled access and execute in a very limited form is employed in Pentium 4. If you look at this, Pentium 4 actually steers instructions based on their types into different queues. And uh, they basically have long queues over here for memory micro operations and integer and floating point micro operations have queues, and these go decoupled from each other. Even though they have out-of-order execution, this adds another level of decoupling, right? You can, uh, basically, these, these two different type of queues, sometimes memory operations get backed up, 
But now you can fetch integer operations. Sometimes this cube gets backed up. Now you can fetch uh, memory operations. It's very limited. It gets part of the benefit of decoupling. Not all of the benefit, like the queues don't exist, for example, because you have some different engine over here. But uh, the decoupling idea, part of the benefit of de decoupling is preserved. And this was my picture, basically. Yeah, that's the decoupled part. OK. So now we've covered uh, everything over here. That's why they're all gray. Let's see. We're now done with this, basically. Everything is green. So I'm happy. Hopefully, you're happy. Um, any questions? Yes. Three slides, well. Yeah, maybe a few more. A few more, okay. Uh, Which one? Yeah, here. Yeah, here. Mm. So if you have um, a why, why does this reduce loop exist? Oh. Like in the end, you, if you do prediction, right, you only have to just predict maybe twice or better and not to leave the loop? That's right. So uh, here you, you have 100, uh, you, you do this, for example, 100 times, right? I equals I plus 1. Whereas he, here you do this 50 times. Right, that's one example of reduced loop maintenance. Yeah, that's branches, but you still would predict it in the correct way if you had some kind of prediction, right? Uh, that's right, yes. So you have less branches, so you need to do less predictions. That's right, yes. You may, you have a, if you have a reasonable predictor, you could predict it well. But remember, actually, uh, loop unrolling is especially beneficial when you have a bad predictor, uh, for the branch part at least. The code optimization part is different. But you're, you're absolutely correct. You're, if you have a good predictor, uh, you're, uh, the real benefit you're getting is not in terms of prediction benefit, but really eliminating of that branch. Now you don't have a branch. You, have, you can fetch one more instruction that's hopefully useful. <laughs> yeah. But this is especially useful when you don't have a good predictor. And this, uh, uh, the uh, aeronautics, uh, um, yeah, that's astronautics processor that was in the 1980s when the predictors were really bad. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes? Could you say it again? If you don't have to look into the array? Yeah, if I Okay. Oh, I see. Uh, yeah, 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 sure. You can, you can do that. This is just to give an example. It's not optimized code. <laughs> okay? <laughs> yeah, normally you would actually load it and then, uh, and then buffer it and then use it in multiple instructions, right? You, you won't do m multiple memory accesses. But this is at the, the high level, C level code. The lower level thing may be very different. Any other question? OK, so let, let's go back here. Maybe we'll take a break. So basically, we're done with this. Uh, should we take a quick break? Yes. OK, let's take a break. I don't want to do it uh, maybe 10 minutes. Is that good? So we come back at 25. Okay, let's get started. Before I give you a choice of what to cover, I'll go back to this loop example because it's bothered several of you. Uh, this is just to show that you can actually unroll. This is not, a, not the most beautiful example, I agree. But basically, this shows that one iteration, instead of having a single iteration, you have two of these over here. And now you can analyze this entire code and optimize it. Right? But that's not what we've done over here. Now, if you take the architecture course that I teach later, we'll figure out how to enlarge this block even more and do different optimizations across the block, right? So, for example, uh, uh, and this code actually has a lot of other issues as well inside it, but you can actually enable some optimization opportunities by looking at a long sequential piece of code instead of something that's really... Uh, uh, that really has branches. Ideally, you would like a long sequential piece of code and you can move the instructions anywhere. Right? 
this enables that long sequential uh, piece of code because you've unrolled and you put two iterations into one. So you could actually put 50 iterations into one. Another thing that one of you pointed out, this is actually uh, not iterating an uh, even number of times, right? Basically, this has that problem. That is intentional so that it makes you think. Basically, this doesn't work correctly, this loop itself, right? But that shows you the difficulty of actually how uh, even such a simple optimization like this could lead to incorrect code. And these are real considerations in the compiler design uh, today. So takeaways, if you replicate the loop body multiple times within an iteration, you can reduce loop maintenance overhead and enlarge the basic block so you can do more scheduling opportunities. But the problem is you need to make it work correctly and you need to make it perform well. And if you're increasing the code size, you're not necessarily performing well. Okay. So let's see. Uh, here, since this is my last lecture, I'll give you a choice. <laughs> we have, let's see how many choices we have. One, two, three, four. And I'm going to take a vote. <laughs> now listen carefully to the choices. The first choice, we can do an exercise that may look like an exam question. <laughs> Looking at a GPU, it's a fun question, I love this. Uh, the second choice, we could start talking about multiprocessors, which is really the natural extension after the slide. And we could briefly talk about what are the issues of multiprocessors. And the later architecture course that follows this actually talks a lot about memory systems and multiprocessors. Basically everything that we did not really cover in detail, parallel processing. So that would be the start or hint of what, to, what is to come next in the future. That's the second choice. The third choice, we could talk about uh, one of my favorite topics, DRAM refresh. We've actually briefly talked about it, if you remember, in the second lecture. But uh, in this, if you, if you talk about that, you will learn about a cool concept called bloom filters. How many of you know about bloom filters? Oh, you guys, <laughs> okay. Maybe, maybe you will be voted down with that choice since you know about it. But it's still fun. You will learn how, to, how, how, how that could be used for uh, refresh. And the fourth choice is we do nothing and we finish the lecture right now. <laughs> okay, I'll give you one more, one more choice. Fifth choice, you can ask any questions you want. <laughs> Doing nothing and you can ask any questions you want. I guess those could be separate choices. So, okay. <laughs> Everybody knows the, uh, knows the choices now? So who wants the first choice, which is going through the GPU exercise? Wow, everybody likes the GPUs. Okay, that's a big majority, uh, but let's, uh, let's do the other ones. The second choice was multiprocessors. Well, that's still not so bad. Maybe we need to count these in the end. Are you double voting? <laughs> 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 that's a problem in real elections, so. <laughs> uh, the, the third choice is, what was the third choice? <laughs> refresh, yes, DRAM refresh. DRAM refresh. Okay, that's smaller, so we've eliminated the DRAM refresh part. Uh, calling the lecture now, done. Who wants that? <laughs> don't be scared. <laughs> there are no re repercussions of this if you, if you don't want. <laughs> okay, there's zero votes for that, really? Okay, that's fine, that's done. Or taking questions, any questions? Okay, that's done also. So we'll need, to, we'll need a re-vote, so this is the second round of the election. <laughs> we basically need to choose between this, an example GPU exercise, or multiprocessors. So vote carefully. Who votes for the GPU exercise? Well, I need to count, or somebody needs to count because this is gonna, going to be close, I think. <laughs> Up high, <laughs> especially if you want to vote for this. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13. 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. Okay. Well, my approximate <laughs> computation tells me it's about 38. So what about multiprocessors? Okay, I, I see double voting here, but maybe, <laughs> well, definitely double voting there, but 
Yeah, this seems less to me, but let's try it again. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, twenty-one, eighteen, nineteen. 18, 19. Okay, this is definitely less. So approximately it's 22. So 38 versus 22. I guess the GPU exercise wins, right? <laughs> so we'll have to do the GPU exercise. It's fun. Uh, let's see if we can... Do it. If it ends early, we'll do the multiprocessors, but I doubt that it'll end early. <laughs> and where did I put this thing? But multiprocessor is also fun. <laughs> okay. So if you look at this, this could potentially these actually this is actually a really fun question, I think. Uh, and uh, if you haven't seen it before, it it may be perplexing. But if you know how to do it, it's not that perplexing. So basically, uh, we define the SIMD utilization of a program run on a GPU as a fraction of SIMD lanes that are kept busy with active threads during the run of a program. This active thread is executing an instruction. It's not masked out, right? It's really doing an operation. The following code segment is run on a GPU. Again, of course, this is simplified. We're not going to give you complex code. Each thread executes a single iteration of the shown loop this loop. Assume that the data values of the arrays A, B, C are already in vector registers, so there are no loads and stores in this program. So there's a hint that says, notice that there are four instructions in each thread. There are four, right? One is a branch, two, three, four. That's it. And we're assuming that the branch is done in one instruction, clearly. A warp in the GPU consists of 64 threads. Remember, a warp is a group of threads that are executing the same instruction. And there are 64 SIMD lanes in the GPU. So you can execute a warp in one cycle, let's say. OK, the first question is the easy one. How many warps does it take to execute this program? Anybody? So basically, we have some number of iterations. Each thread executes one iteration. A warp consists of 64 threads. Yes? Approximately 16 million. Okay, so what did you do? Yeah, Give... 16,000. 16, so you divided this, uh, this 1 million yeah. with 64. 64. Yes, that's right. That's exactly the answer, basically. 1 million, this 1m divided by 64. Because each thread executes one of the iterations, and a warp has 64 threads, right? That's it. So it's pretty simple. The first one. Now we're going to get more complicated and I will need potentially more space. So the second question, well, it would be nice to have these both on the same screen. Oh, this is a tough question. It's a reverse engineering question. <laughs> there could be a forward uh, engineering question over here also. But I'll give you the reverse one because it's more fun. When we measure the SIMD utilization for this program with one input set, you run it with some input set, we find that it is 67 divided by 256. What can you say about arrays A, B, and C? Be precise. Sounds like fun, right? So this program, the utilization that you get is 67 divided by 256. And remember, utilization is, SIMD utilization is the fraction of SIMD lanes that are kept busy with active threads. Active threads means threads that are executing useful instructions. So if you're, for example, executing something, but you're not supposed to really execute that, give that result, because your branch should not be taken that way, that's not an active threat. Yes? That's right. That's uh, one out of 64 A's is positive. That's good. Anybody else? Or does anybody else agree or disagree? We can vote on this also. Did anybody else get the? 
Yes, I see nods. <laughs> so that's the answer, actually. Basically, one element out of every 64 should be positive for you to be able to get 67 divided by 256. Right? But it's precisely one every 64. You don't care which, six, which of the ones in that 64, but precisely one should be uh, positive. Now let's take a look at why that's the case. Should I go through it or not? Yes. Okay. <laughs> I hear a yes. So I'll need to replicate this. Oh, I have a copy of it. That's the good part. Actually, I'll start with how you can get some other utilization first. Okay, let's actually look at this. So SIMD utilization, 67 over 256 is kind of weird. Uh, but let's, let's look at a, a SIMD utilization of 100%. Can you get 100% here? And what's the condition under which you would get 100%? Actually, that's the next question. Let's do the next question first. Because 67 out of 256 is a little bit harder. So the next question is, is it possible for this program to yield a SIMD utilization of 100%? Yes or no? If yes, what should be true about arrays A, B, C for the SIMD utilization to be 100%? Be precise. If no, explain why not. And you have space for explaining what should be true about A, B, C separately. All right, go ahead. All elements of A are positive. Yes, that's correct. That's a sufficient answer. Or is that a sufficient answer? <laughs> that's one answer. Absolutely true. If all elements of A are positive, you would get 100% SIMD utilization. Exactly, yeah, that's basically, <laughs> that's right, that's a more comprehensive answer, basically. <laughs> Out of every 64, either all of them are positive or all of them are negative. So let's take a look at why that's the case. Basically, what this is looking at is, this single iteration is looking at whether AI is greater than zero. If AI is greater than zero, meaning that element is positive, you're going to execute all of these three instructions. Each iteration, you're definitely going to execute the branch. There is no escaping the branch, right? Remember, we have four instructions. The branch, if the branch is taken, you're going to execute three more instructions. If the branch is not taken, you're going to execute only one instruction. Now, we're not doing one iteration at a time. We're doing 64 iterations at the same time, right? That's the warp. Now, if you want 100% SIMD utilization, we want all of the warps, all of the iterations, to execute exactly the same instructions. Right? Meaning they need to take the branch exactly the same way. So if the consecutive 64 elements of AI are all greater than zero, they will all execute this code on different data elements. So you will get 100% SIMD utilization. Now if consecutive 64 elements of AI are all less than zero, they will, none of them will execute this piece of code, but they will all execute the branch. So you will still get a SIMD utilization of 100%. Because they're all executing the branch, and all of the, uh, they're, they're not really wasting any lanes, basically. Does that make sense? Hopefully that's clear. So 100% is the easier case. Now, given this, you can try to think about how do you come up with 67 over 256, right? Basically, yeah, let me move over here now. So I like thinking of this as visually. Yes? Oh. Yes. Oh, 
I see. Basically, the other assumption here is these arrays don't overlap with each other. That's a very good point. Yeah. So you're changing AI. That doesn't matter for the next iteration, but the arrays should not overlap. That's a very good point. <laughs> okay. Let's go to this thing. So I have this code over here, right? Oh, you cannot see it? You can see it. Good. And I'll turn off the autofocus after I focus it. Okay. Am I doing something incorrectly in this one? Because this is not very helpful, is it? Can you see this? Not so great. Good enough? Yes? Okay. So how do I turn off autofocus? Okay. It's turned off now. Okay, basically we have this. Uh, so I like thinking of array A. So the, the thing that really matters is uh, this test over here, right? Uh, let me all do this. You basically have an array A, which is 1 million elements. And we're really taking 64 elements at a time. So if... Within the 64, all of these 64 elements are individually greater than zero. Basically, you're going to execute all of the instructions over here. You're going to do 64 branches for sure. You're going to do 64 adds, uh, multiplies here, 64 of this, 64 of this. So you get 256 total and 256 of them are useful because they're all doing useful work. Right? The same is true if all of these elements are actually uh, less than or equal to zero. Right? That way, so this is, if all of these are greater than zero, you get 256 over 66, uh, 256. Now, if you look at another case where they're all less than or equal to zero, then you execute only this one, right? The branch. So you execute two, 64 branches, and all 64 of them are useful, meaning everybody needs to execute it because it's really unconditional, so you get 100% utilization. So these are different kind of 100% utilization, but in the end, they're both 100% utilization. So now, now let's see how we can actually get... So we're trying to get 67 over 256. And the question is... That's what we measured. How is this possible? Well, let's take a look at, again, divide this into 64 element chunks, the array. So we have these 64 elements. Now let's execute these operations. Branch operation, all 64 threads will execute it, right? Because you need to test each of the elements. So you clearly need to do at least 64 operations, and 64 of them are useful. So I'm going to express SIMD utilization this way. SIMD utilization is equal to useful operations divided by total number of possible operations. Right. It's the same thing as this, basically. The fraction of SIMD lanes that are kept busy with active threads during the run of a program. So, okay. Definitely everyone is going to execute the branch over here, 64. And definitely, if we execute the branch, we're going to do 64 operations. Now, we need to get to 67. How do we make this equal to 67 divided by 256? Now we have 64 here, 64 here. Well, 67 looks like we add 3 to this. And... 192 this, right? Now, if you look at the structure of the code, that makes a lot of sense. So you get three useful operations, but execute 192 possible operations. Because we're executing always 64, right? How do you get 64? Well, you execute three warps, if you will, three instructions. And only one thing is useful among it, right? So it's clear that you need to go into this loop, but you do it. Uh, but only one of the elements 
are really causing you to do useful operations. And what is that element? Well, you don't know which one. You have 64 of them. So 64 threads will execute the multiply. 64 threads will execute the next add. And 64 threads will execute the next add. They will execute. I mean, they will occupy the SIMD lanes. But only one of them will be useful. And one of them will be useful means that only one of them is really greater than zero, right? Make sense? So that's the idea over here. So the right answer over here is for A, we can say that uh, exactly one of every 64, ah, oh, that's bad, elements is greater than zero. For B, I can say nothing. For C, I can say nothing. Remember, the question is asking, what can you say about A, B, C? I can say nothing about what's in the B and C, but if you really want to be precise, you should say what she mentioned, which is these arrays really should not be overlapping. But that's okay. I think you can assume that in these examples in general. Does that make sense? It's cool, right? <laughs> Could you, could you say it again? You're saying that here, it means that only one yes. is bigger than zero. Mm -hmm. No, no, you, you take the branch. So remember, uh, you're executing 64 threads at a time. If any one of them is greater than zero, you should take those instructions. And you, you can only do 64 operations at a time. You cannot do one operation at a time. So you really need to, all of the threads need to go that way, but only one of them is really useful. That's the, that's the idea of the GPU. Does that make sense? Because you're really operating at the granularity of a warp, and a warp consists of 64 threads. And 64 threads that are operating on consecutive data elements and if any one of them is one, you're forced to execute these instructions. <laughs> the only time you don't go into this loop is when none of them is zero. Uh, none of them is greater than zero. So that's the tricky part of the question, really. Uh, the, the fact that you're doing everything at the granularity of a warp. And this shows that how bad your SIMD utilization can also get, right? If, if, if your threads are behaving differently. Okay, let's, uh, let's go to, oh, there's another, there's another part of the question, actually. So is this clear to everyone? If not, I would encourage you to study it, uh, because it's really fun. It's not that hard. Uh, once you understand what's going on, it's not that hard. Oh. Okay, let's go back to this, because there is a, another part of the question. By the way, this is an easier question. What if you had an else over there? You might start thinking about that. <laughs> if you had an else over there, then the, some other threads would do something different. <laughs> okay, let's go to the last part of the question. Uh, so we've already answered this, basically. Is it possible for this program to yield a SIMD utilization of, uh, yeah, 100%? Then the answer is, uh, I mean, the most precise answer is, for a given chunk of 64 Elements in array A, that chunk of consecutive elements, that chunk should be either all greater than zero or less than or equal to zero. Right. But I think we accept other answers that are not necessarily fully comprehensive, for example. For example, you can say all elements of A are greater than zero or less than or equal to zero. That's fine. That's not fully comprehensive because there could be parts of array A that could be greater than zero in their, in their 64 element chunks and parts of other parts of A that could be less than or equal to zero also. Okay, let's look at the last one. It's another thinking question. I like these thinking questions. 
So is it possible for this program to yield a SIMD utilization of 25%? And circle one, yes or no. If yes, what should be true about arrays A, B, and C for the SIMD utilization to be 25%? If no, explain why not. Well, let's go back to the code. Yes, <laughs> you have the answer very quick. Yeah. That's right, yeah. Yeah, basically, the, the, we, we, gave, we gave you the boundary condition with the 67. Why? Because this happens 60, uh, so when, when do you get the lowest SIMD utilization here? You can think about that. I mean, one thinking you may have is either none of the threads take this loop, right? Basically, none of the threads take the branch within the 64 threads. That's not correct because we already calculated that at least 100% utilization because all of them execute the branch only and you're executing 64 branches and all of them are useful. So clearly, none of the threads taking the branch, that doesn't give you the lowest SIMD utilization. That gives you the highest, 100%. Now let's go to the next one. What if one thread takes the branch? Which is what we just did actually, 67 over 256. By the way, that's another way of getting the answer for 67 to 156. You keep trying these values. <laughs> but that's a harder one, perhaps. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, if you have one of the threads taking the branch, that's the minimum you can get. Uh, and we just calculated that your SIMD utilization is everybody executes the branch, 64, and only one executes the other instruction, so you get 3. 64 plus 3 divided by 256 slots is... 67 divided by 256, which is just a little over, over than, greater than 25%. Uh, because 25% is 64 divided by 256, right? Now, any value, any other value will lead to a higher SIMD utilization. So you really cannot get 25% SIMD utilization on this code. The lowest you can get is 67 divided by 256. Which is good, because you have a lower bound on how well utilized your machine is, right? Okay, well, I think we're done with the question. Any, anything on this? Do you guys like this question? No? Okay. <laughs> I see both. <laughs> some heads shaking, some heads nodding. So how many people like this question? Maybe let's take a vote on that one. Okay, that's, that's a good number. How many people don't like this question? <laughs> You guys don't, why don't you like it? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I see. So in, 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 yeah, that's right. It's sometimes hard to clarify these, but you can always write down your assumptions. That's always a good thing, basically. You can, you can say, in fact, that's, that shows me as the examiner that you're thinking. Which is always a big plus, right? So in the end, uh, I think uh, the, the biggest value of, the, the biggest thing that an examination should test is whether you're really thinking uh, when you're answering the question. So it's perfectly fine if you write down your assumptions. And if your assumption is that these are overlapping, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> then it's going to be a very hard question to solve. <laughs> but I think you can safely assume in a lot of these questions that they're not overlapping. That's perfectly fine. But please write down your assumptions. That's, that's always a really good thing uh, to do. And why don't you like it? <laughs> I don't want to single out the <laughs> not likers, but I'm curious. I'm sorry, I cannot hear you. <laughs> oh, I see. <laughs> that's not a great answer, but that's okay. <laughs> we won't hold you, <laughs> hold you to that. So the reason I like this question is I think I, it requires thinking to answer uh, the question. Basically, you cannot just... Uh, make up a result. And if it requires you to put down your assumptions, that's perfectly fine. In an exam situation, if it's monitored, you're, you can perfectly come to me or the examiner and ask, let's clarify this assumption. So we, we always uh, write down what you should assume if we actually are aware of that. 
Okay. I guess we don't really have time for multiprocessors, but if you're interested in that, you know where to go. <laughs> okay. I guess I won't see you next week, uh, but if you have any questions, feel free to email me. Uh, I mean, next week, still come to the lectures because one of those sessions will be a review session, and there might be a surprise in one of the sessions also. We'll see. It's not decided yet, but we've covered a lot of material uh, in this course. It's not clear if we will cover more. But there might be a surprise multiprocessor session, who knows? <laughs> okay, unless there are any other questions. Okay, well, have a good weekend then. Thank you.